Good evening, everyone. I'm Colin Bailey, the director of the Morgan Library and Museum. It's a pleasure to welcome you all for a conversation between Pedro Correa da Lago and Christine Nelson, and to the first, if you like, unveiling of The Magic of Handwriting, exhibition of over of 140 items selected from the capacious collection that Pedro has established, or has been establishing since he was 12 years old. Il ne faut pas toucher aux idoles, la durure reste aux mains. We should not touch our idols, the gilding will remain on our hands. This is a comment that f appears in Madame Bovary by Flaubert. And of course, there is a Flaubert manuscript in the exhibition, a letter to Hugo from, the, from June of 1869. And Flaubert's comment, which resonates for me, in a way sets up the possible disappointment of actually meeting your idol, of getting too close to your idol, of touching something that you have venerated and admired. In this exhibition, we have an opportunity to get very, very close, not no touching, but very, very close to a, a, a series of marvelous men and women, artists, writers, historians, creators, whose thoughts, ideas, com intimate comments, photographs, allow us a glimpse into the creative life. And this is the exhibition that Pedro has made possible and that Christine has been working on very diligently for the past several months. The exhibition is in six or seven sections. Its design is, for us, quite uh, innovative. We share the pleasure of the same designer as the Olympics in Brazil, um, and we're very grateful. We're very grateful to, um, to Daniela Thomas and Felipe Tassaro of TNG Projectus and the graphic designers Fabio Prata and Flavia Nalon. You will be able to see the exhibition, which will remain open for an hour after the conversation that will take place. We're in, we are in a digital age. Handwriting may be dead, but it is a pleasure to look at works made by hand. And in this regard, Pedro shares the passion of our founder, John Pierpont Morgan, who as a young man began to collect autographs. Pedro too, at the age of 12, sent letters to prominent people soliciting their autographs. Uh, Francois Truffaut said yes, he'll tell us about some of the people who said no, but rather than focusing on a single figure then, uh, Pedro began to enlarge his collection to cover the scope of creativity, simply, simply said, in Western culture. And the results, a sampling of the results, are upstairs. This is the first major exhibition in, in America of his collection. The project has a long life. Um, it began under my predecessor, Bill Griswold, was m moved forward e energetically by Peggy Fogelman, and the selection initially made by Declan Kiley, who was our head of literary and historical manuscripts, we've lost him to the New York Public Library. Having created this co co corpus of works, Christine Nelson, the Drew Heinz curator of literary manuscripts, worked tirelessly with Pedro to refine the selection, to make some additions and, and suggestions, and to create what is a really illuminating uh, display upstairs. No less illuminating are the pithy um, introductions and the erudite explanations of the documents on hand. And we're very, very proud as well that Tashin Publishers will be produce, have, are producing a catalogue that will be a permanent record of this exhibition. Before inviting Pedro and Christine to the podium, I want to recognize the support of the Dillon Fund, who have made a major gift in memory of Douglas Dillon. Mr. Dillon was a fellow of the Morgan from 1952 and served for 32 years on the Morgan's Board of Trustees. And so it's very touching to us that the Dillon Foundation is supporting this show so generously. I also want to mention Patricia and Antonio Bonacristiano, Levi and Salmo Ad Advogados, Picte North America, Galleria Almeida and Dale, Susan Tain, and Roy A. Silva. Please join me now in welcoming Pedro and Christine in a conversation that will tell us that handwriting is not dead.
Thank you very much. First of all, welcome to the Morgan, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. I want to join Colin in thanking you so much for sharing your collection with us here and with all of our guests. Um, it's a privilege for me. <laughs> <laughs> you've been with us so much in the last week. I feel like you've moved in, and you're most welcome. <laughs> I wouldn't mind staying here. I hope you feel <laughs> quite at home here. Uh, in the company of Pierpont Morgan, yeah, well. a predecessor of yours as a great autograph collector. Yeah. So we just, as you know, finished installing the exhibition yesterday. It looks absolutely magnificent. Thank you. So I don't know if any of the designers are with us tonight, but we're grateful They've for left, their contributions. They're very modest. <laughs> um, and we do hope that you forgive us for installing your great Proust manuscript upside down. <laughs> it has to side. It has to side. So you could have chosen yes, this one. And as uh, a friend mentioned to me um, earlier when I told him about this faux pas, that with Proust, there are always two ways. Wow. Very good. Very good. <laughs> so again, thank you for all that you have done to bring us to this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I mean, this is the future book uh, that Colin <laughs> mentioned uh, that will be published by Tashin. We have here the proof, and um, it was written by Christine. And I'm very grateful for what it's you did. It's been a great collaboration all along. Thank you. So I'd like to start by talking about our title. Actually, let me see. Um, so the magic of handwriting, as I understand it, since I came to this project a little bit late, um, is a title that you suggested and that we enthusiastically embraced. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, I mean, there were famous collectors, of course, uh, that uh, we like to recollect, and Goethe was one of them. But Stefan Zweig is the one that had the approach that uh, I feel more akin to, okay. you know, because. Uh, I mean, Zweig was, I mean, I have many reasons to like Zweig. Yes. I mean, I like his writing. Uh, I like, uh, of course, he formed an extraordinary collection of what I call the aristocracy of the manuscripts, which are the, man, the documents of creation. I mean, the pieces of paper that have received the inspiration directly in drafts or... Like the upside-down Proust manuscript. Exactly, yes. like the Proust manuscript or like uh, several others in the exhibition, not many. I'm not, he collected mostly these. Uh, he was very successful in selling his biographies, so he had a lot more means, and it was easier to find these things. Most of them are in museums today. And um, he eventually committed suicide in my country, so I feel particularly close to him. And uh, as uh, he claimed Goethe as an ancestor, as collector, and I claim him in a, yes. in a very modest way, but in the sense that I really wanted to pay homage to, I mean, he wrote beautifully about autographs. Unfortunately, I don't read German that well, no. so I can't. Uh, uh. So the magic of handwriting, as you said so often, is a sentence in a letter to Hilke where he said that thanks to his collection or his love of manuscripts, he discovered the magic of handwriting. And that's what it's all about, I mean, for private collectors, but I hope for the public as well. You know, looking at the exact uh, I mean, the very documents that carry a message in the hand of a person. I mean, for a collector, it's the closest link you can establish with someone who predeceased your birth by many, sometimes centuries, and whom you admire. I mean, you are holding a piece of paper that they also held in their hands. The more, more important the content, of course, the more important the moment for that person. Sometimes they solve... Uh, deep personal problems mm -hmm. with a letter or uh, sometimes it's a love letter, sometimes it's a tragic letter. But you hold emotions and you, it's, it, I feel much closer to the person once I own a letter of them. I read more about them. So it's a pursuit that has enhanced my life in, in many, many ways and the source of innumerable small and great joy. So we thank Stefan Zweig for giving us the yes. title of our exhibition. Um, and so for you, what is magical about handwriting then is that sense of intimacy with these figures from the past. It's not so much about um, 
the magic of unlocking the secret personality of these no, people? No, no, right. I don't believe in graphology, for right. instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and it's not that much the hand, I mean, I, I find beauty in many handwritings yes. that our parents would find <laughs> terrible scrawls. Appalling. <laughs> Napoleon. Appalling, but <laughs> I, you can find something. But um, no, it's, it's basically, of course, the content that makes it. Right. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, people of the 19th century had to sit at their tables every day. I mean, a man like Victor Hugo or Longfellow mm -hmm. would write uh, 50 uh, messages a day of, mm -hmm. I, I, I cannot go, I can't go, right. please come for dinner, lend me this book. Uh, the, so that's not what you're after, obviously. That's not exactly what I'm after, mm -hmm. but some, for some very rare individuals, sometimes you have to content yourself with a minor item. I've exactly. tried to select the ones that are less minor for the exhibition. Well, <laughs> behind us, of course, is one of the major, major items yes. in, the, in the exhibition. I thought we'd start by looking at a few of the items that people will be able to see after our talk, um, just to give a sense of the range of your collection. And I'd love to look at them with you and have you with tell us friend. about them and um, tell us really what you find magical about them. So I know you'll know at a glance what's right behind. Well, I mean, Van Gogh, of course, is everybody's favorite, you know, because, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, his letters are very rare in the market. It okay. took me many years to be able to afford one, and I mean, I don't even know yet how I paid for it okay. in many installments over uh, two years, I mean. But um, this was a letter that uh, conquered me entirely, because, of course, when it was first sold uh, 50 or 60 years ago, it didn't reach a very high price because I think people didn't think much of it uh, because it's written two months before his death and it seemed like a rather trivial letter right. written to the innkeepers in Arles where he had lived for several years asking them to send uh, the remaining things that he had there. But by doing things, and this was, letter was then bought by a very famous dealer who also described it in his catalog, in my opinion, missing the point. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and basically, it's an incredibly moving letter because by saying what he wants in Paris and what the innkeepers can keep, he draws an inventory of his own room in Arles, which is arguably the most famous room in Western painting today, which is in everybody's retina. You say that? Retina? Well, how do you pronounce that retina. word? Retina. Retina. Yes. So um, I think, uh, you know, it ends up giving an extraordinary uh, side to this, to this item that is not immediately per right, perceived. Right, so the, the words are very ordinary on first The words glance, are ordinary, right? but it's Please quite Please send moving. me my mattress, maybe <laughs> take, the, take the straw well, out. Yeah. Um, but also it's quite moving because he was so poor that he asked the mattresses to be sent, I mean, by the slowest possible train, but please empty them of empty the straw them because replacing the straw will be less expensive than paying the, 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 weight, of the, uh, the weight of the straw which is quite moving, that this is a very small economy, as you can imagine. Exactly. So here we have in 1889, Van Gogh leaving the asylum, deciding to move north, telling Gino that he hasn't been well, but he's completely recovered now. Yeah, which he was in the So first. part of the poignancy, of course, is that we know the end of the story. Yeah. And we know that even though he was claiming to be completely recovered, that within months he would commit suicide. Yes, that this is a characteristic uh, that someone pointed, and you pointed as well, of several items in this exhibition yes. that are written uh, approaching death, let's say. I mean, or in the last few months or weeks or sometimes days mm -hmm. of the people's lives, you know. I think, the, I mean, these items move me especially because yes. we, 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 we are private of a secret, they weren't, you know. I mean, we know they're about to die and they don't, you know. So it's, it's quite moving too. To, to read these letters. Well, we can't look at your Van Gogh letter without looking at its very moving companion. And um, I, I hope that when you look through the exhibition, you'll notice some of these connections, some more subtle than others, um, items juxtaposed with related items. Um, and here in the exhibition, you'll see this letter, which I hope you'll tell us about now, right next to the Van Gogh letter that we just looked at. Well, this, of course, is the, what I call the dream letter, yes. you know, because, I mean, uh, Gauguin says, I had to change my plans. I, I, I was planning to stay one year in the south of France, working next to a friend who, who also a painter. Unfortunately, this friend became completely mad 
and I had to fear during a month uh, an, an accident, a tragic or cruel uh, or, or fatal accident. So he, he really feared for his life at that moment. And letters of Gauguin referring to the famous episode uh, of, of Van Gogh are almost uh, non-existent. And that's mostly, you want Gauguin to speak about his own work, or if not, you know, mention his most famous friendship. Right. So this is a letter that always moved me. I missed it the first time it oh, was optioned. Yes. I mean, I couldn't afford it. And the second time around, I made a crazy move and I bought it yeah, well, 10 years later. We're grateful yeah. that you did. And it still hasn't later. been published in its entirety as far as I know. Oh, really? Oh, that, you're, so. you're a much better scholar so. than I. <laughs> but I it will be know. very soon, as soon as the book comes out. <laughs> well, right? yes, the, when the book comes up. So this is just weeks after Van Gogh's severe breakdown when he yeah. mutilated his left ear. It's and January. You, you, yes, yeah, so exactly. weeks afterwards, so in immediate proximity to yeah. the incident. So really an extraordinary acquisition. Yeah, that's what we look for in a, in a, in a document like this, you know. I mean, uh, not only I moved, of course, because I admire Gauguin deeply, and he also speaks of his own work in uh, very expressive words. But, you know, I mean, he was thinking of this friend, and, uh, yeah. and now, you know, you feel like a sort of second and secret addressee of the letter, you know, I mean, which, of course, was not meant for you, exactly. you know, but it's now you're in your hands. Well, please introduce this one. <laughs> so you'll, Your you'll countryman. See the, you'll see that the handwriting here is uh, very childish. So this is Ernie. signed Ernie at the bottom. That's Ernie Hemingway. Um, he is, is he about 12 here, Pedro? Yes, I think so. So he's writing a letter to Dear Daddy. I'm, just, I'm actually going to try to read it. Yes. Can you see it from the <coughs> Dear Daddy, I feel a lot better when all my work is done and my conscience is clear. <laughs> I looked up in my baseball schedule and found that the New York Giants play Chicago, and then he inserted Cubs, Cubs, for the championship on Saturday, May 11th. Of course, the championship wasn't on May 11th. He probably meant for the leadership in the league uh, next Saturday. And uh, we'll have choir rehearsal in the morning, and the afternoon will be, we'll be free. The game starts at 3 o'clock. Let's see if we can't go. It will be a dandy game the last of the series. Yours lovingly, Ernie. Good night. God bless you, Daddy. And then, I'm not sure what's going on here. Toosies. To Toosies? Is it Tootsies? Is it, I don't know. We don't know. It's a round if thing. If anyone has a theory, please let us know yes. after, yes. after the conversation. Yeah. Pardon me? Tootsie Rolls. Tootsie Rolls? Yeah. Did they sell those at um, the Cubs Stadium? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good theory. We'll, well, we'll ponder you. that. We'll ponder that. <laughs> But again, this is in the category of the Van Gogh, where you know we here we have Hemingway as a boy, not we know, knowing we yet. We know we will become in Hemingway. We he know doesn't. he will become <laughs> Ernest, and not Ernie Hemingway. He oh, and by the way, I I don't know if you agree with me, but I assumed when he writes that he's writing from the Pullman sleeper that he's joking, that he's really in his own bed. Yes, at home. most probably. Yes. <laughs> The, there, there are always mysteries left yes, in letters right, right. that die with the people who wrote them, right, and then right. well, we have to try and interpret the private jokes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we're very appreciative that in um, selections that you made with us for the exhibition, that you made a lot of nods to previous projects oh, here yes, at the Morgan. Yeah. So the Hemingway exhibition curated by my former colleague Declan Kiley. Um, I thank you for including some Saint Exupéry. Yes, in your um, homage to you. In homage to well, in homage and to Saint Exupéry. And the Fragonard in homage to Colin. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Emily Dickinson, Oscar yeah. Wilde, all of these people we featured in Morgan. No, I mean you can imagine. I mean, for a boy of 17 who first came to New York and came to the Morgan and saw in the flesh manuscripts by Mozart, letters of right. Wilde and Dickens. I mean, I, I was in uh, completely. I mean, I was entering a sacred temple, you know, and so <laughs> for me, it's uh, an incredible privilege to be exhibiting this collection here. It's a perfect yeah. place for it. So alongside Hemingway's letter, I know you can't see this uh, very well from there, but I wanted to show you the sheet in its entirety. We now move to grown-up Hemingway. Yes. So you acquired a whole collection of these forms from the British 
who's who yes, that were yeah. filled out by hand by, hand, by the yes. people who w were featured. I mean, I don't know if you are familiar with the idea of who's who, but it was a large reference book that would bring the, the biographies, still exists, still yeah. exists yeah. the biographies of the most notable living people uh, together and also their addresses. And it was a, a reference book. And the, the first one was invented in, in, in England at the end of the 19th century. And it was, it worked and it was a profitable business for over a hundred years. And then in the early 2000s, it, it was bought by a very large um, a publishing house. And in one of those managerial decisions that are yeah. debatable, they decided to get rid of the, the archive, right. you know, which occupied two rooms outside London. Two you know, rooms. yeah, did and you, they wanted Did you acquire them. the whole two rooms worth? No, no, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I acquired a very small portion, okay. you know, I mean, because they wanted it to go to an institution, uh -huh. you know, but they wanted to sell it. And the institutions were all ready to receive it because it was an interesting archive, but not by paying for it. So I offered to pay half of okay. the price for 1% of the forms. I oh. mean, some relatives of mine say, you're crazy, you're, well, you're, 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 paying, you're getting 1% for 50%. <laughs> I said, look, I don't want the rest. I had an incredible impression of uh, sick transit Gloria Mundi, you know, how fame is fleeting right. by going through 200,000 forms in one month. I mean, a friend of mine who was there said, Pedro, what wouldn't you do for autographs? So you, you know, hand-picked the ones. Then uh, I went through the whole thing, you yeah. know, and there were countless barrister at law, uh, headmaster, headmistress who are completely forgotten today, you know, who were important people in there. And suddenly you see Sigmund Freud's form filled in his own hand mm -hmm. or James Joyce's yeah. or, you know. So at the end, I was able to separate about 1,800 that are fantastic because they're like uh, an autobiography, you know, and people were asked about their present position. So Charles de Gaulle in 42 is asked about his present position. He says, leader of the free French, which oh, is what fantastic. we want, you know, and, which is very moving, of course, and many others, you know, and, and Joyce, will you see Joyce or perhaps well, We not? won't hear, oh, but yeah. you'll see Joyce and Alan You'll see Joyce at the exhibition the and present position teacher of the Scuola Superiore di Commercio Trieste and writer. Writer as and an writer, afterthought. Writer comes back. Yes. You know, so, and, and Hemingway this, approached his with a little bit of uh, snark, I would say. Yeah, exactly. So when asked about his career, he just wrote yes. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> birth and parentage, yes. Yes. Oh, he was very ironic in his answers. But I'm going to show you a detail now. Um, a lot of people who filled these out got a little bit creative in the section where they were invited to list their recreations, correct? Yes, Ezra Pound wrote, searching the times for proofs of almost total stupidity. <laughs> you know, complete stupidity, you know, so that was his recreation. Must have been a good exercise. Yeah. So here's what Hemingway listed as his recreations. Shooting and drinking, which go together very well, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to, I was really struck by this stuff. Yeah, well, it's There's moving. Some of the things that we've looked at just now, uh, well, not so much the who's who form, but certainly the Gauguin uh, and the Van Gogh letters are really private documents that take us back to um, you know, intimate moments in people's lives. Whereas this one, which is covered with the handwriting of the leaders of the Cuban Revolution, Castro, Che, Cienfuegos, and others, commemorates in very intimate form a very public moment. And yes, that's what's, what's, what's really struck me about this. So do you want to tell us what yeah, it is? Well, this, this is basically a letter of introduction signed by the former president of Costa Rica, uh, Pepe Figueres, as he was known, who was a, lib I mean, a liberal leader and, of course, a leftist leader. And it's considered leftist by the United States, at least. He had just left the presidency of Costa Rica, and he recommends uh, a journalist. <laughs> to the people, he didn't know that the revolution, <laughs> perhaps he knew already by, by the second that the revolution was He had winning. given them support. Yeah, he had. Yeah. So uh, the guy used the, pay, the, 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 the letter of introduction, not as a letter of introduction, but as a sort of answer uh, to the, he would give it back to Pepe Figueres. So uh, Castro and Che Guevara and all the, the leaders write on the following day or the two following days yes. of 
the victory of revolution, which today in Cuba is like the birth of Christ. I mean, the history exactly. didn't exist before. You know, Even so, if Castro got the, the year wrong. Yeah, he got the year wrong because he didn't realize <laughs> A lot of he was in already January, in 59. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I mean, this is quite momentous, you know, because exactly. these people were writing, I mean, this salute to, to the president of Costa Rica in a, in a, in a moment of great joy. So this know. journalist was carrying this letter of introduction around yeah. as he met all of these revolutionary yeah. leaders in the moment of their victory. Exactly. And ends up creating a sort of autograph book I've celebrating never seen, the victory. I've never seen one item no. where the signatures of Cienfuegos, who died very young right. immediately thereafter. His is on the back. On yeah, the back. he's on the back. He, he was probably the third most important leader. Uh, che and, uh, and, and, and Castro are together. Now for something completely different. Well, this is math by the greatest mathematician ever, probably uh, Isaac Newton. Math that we can understand because it's basically addition and subtraction. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is something I particularly like. <laughs> so I, I, I liked your interpretation of that. <laughs> well, Simple math by the father by of the father modern of calculus, calculus and yes. everything. I was the worst student in mathematics. That's oh, really? really? I mean, I was good in my language or in French where I was cool, but... Well, in some cases in the exhibition, you have featured people who are very well known, such yeah. as Newton, but in roles that are lesser known to yeah, most exactly. of us. So here we have Newton acting as the warden and master of the Royal Mint, yeah. and these sums are additions of coins, coins that were being coinage, coinage, right? coinage, yeah. So it's really just simple addition. We also have in the exhibition his own family tree drawn by him. So I like the association of Newton and tree. You know, yes. I mean, it's always because a good idea. Of course, we remember Newton for <laughs> watching an apple drop from a tree. Yeah. And he's written a very different kind of tree, which is featured in the exhibition. Um, so that gives you, a, our, our guests here, a, a sense of the range. Um, the next thing I'd like to ask you is, what's your sense of how handwriting, what handwriting reveals about a person's state of mind or personality. I know you already said that you don't believe in graphology, <laughs> but what about, so what, I've put up two examples of very distinctive handwriting, Oscar Wilde's on this side, Emily Dickinson's on this side. That's, that's not what you're after so much? Well, I mean, yeah. what I think about is more the, the sort of emotions you have right. when you write, you know, not okay. that much what can be revealed for the, by the way you wrote something, okay. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, of course, is a rather dry, uh, short note from Oscar Wilde to Bram Stoker. I mean, I wanted to say that uh, Dorian Gray is writing to Dracula in a certain way, but uh, I wouldn't let him uh, say that. Uh, but. He, <laughs> that was a little too far, going too far. But basically, what is fun here is that I mean, uh, the first woman uh, Wilde dated uh, eventually married Bram Stoker, who was probably much better marriage material than Oscar Wilde was, you know, and, uh, but here he's writing to the man who basically robbed his first sweetheart. So it has a meaning, even though the content is not fabulous, but he's asking a favor to the guy to whom he owed perhaps an even greater favor. But anyway, uh, that's, that's what I feel most. And you can speak much better of uh, uh, Emily Dickinson's very distinctive handwriting. This one, I find beautiful. I mean, I think she, she had a, an extraordinary way of writing that is very- I've never seen anything I've never like seen this. anyone writing like this either. Yeah. I mean, and, and here, I mean, it's, it's almost like a, a prose a poem, no? Exactly. I mean, uh, you, can, you know it better than I, and uh, Christine uh, moved me by being particularly moved by this letter. This was a late addition to the exhibition, yeah. the one that I was very enthusiastic about. Um, Dickinson is writing to uh, a friend that she, I don't think, had ever met face to face because by this time in her life, Dickinson was living almost exclusively in the, in the privacy of her home. But she maintained connections with people through handwritten correspondence. Yeah. This was her way of remaining connected to the world. And she had profound connections with people through handwriting. So here she's written to a friend saying, um, To be remembered? To be remembered is next to being loved and to be loved is heaven. And is this quite earth? I have never found it so. Yeah, so when you speak about handwriting, I hear in you that message that to be remembered is next to being loved. Well, <laughs> and it doesn't seem to me that you are trying to discover any sort of secret code about 
people's personality. It's more I would be incapable yeah. of finding <laughs> this. <laughs> and yet, and yet, look what we have here. Oh yes, that's, but that's the sheer beauty of this the mess. Puccini. Yeah. Of the messy handwriting, you know. I mean, I'm not a specialist in musical handwriting, okay. but I, 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 I can see it's messy. You know, yeah. I mean, it's probably perfectly technically Messy is one okay. word for it, or perhaps energetic. Energetic, that's probably better. Spirited, <laughs> frenzied. But it looks, this page for me moves me aesthetically, I must right. say. Right. Because there's something very strong in it. I mean... Uh, there and, is, uh, and even though you might not want to analyze... Puccini's personality. Oh, this is for the Girl of the Golden West, which yeah, said. Yeah, part of his page. sketches. Um, even though you might not wish to analyze his personality based on this, certainly it gives you a sense of his energy in the moment of competition. He's Italian, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can feel that. <laughs> okay, so that's quite a range. Um, and here we have, um, just to say briefly, a letter from Mozart to his father. A paper cut by Hans Christian Andersen, inscribed to uh, Mary Grant Kramer, who was President Ulysses Grant's niece. We have a note from Mary Shelley in Italian, written just a few months after um, the, the death of her was. husband, Percy Shelley, fellow writer, um, asking the Italian authorities to turn over the boat in which he drowned and all of its contents. And a little sketch by Michelangelo, which he has annotated by hand, placing an order for pieces of marble for his first architectural commission, the facade of San Lorenzo, which remained unbuilt. So what a range here. So I would like to move now to talk to you about your strategy as a collector. So Lack of strategy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we, uh, we have a friend in common, Susan Tame, yes. who's a great friend of the Morgan. Uh -huh. and. Um, she made a very sensible decision when she decided to become a collector. She found an author that, that she was very passionate about, Edgar Allan Poe, and began to collect very deeply anything that she could find related to Edgar Allan Poe. That's a sensible approach to collecting, wouldn't you say? So much clever. <laughs> <laughs> so much clever. Now, you have done quite the opposite. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't a decision I took okay. in one precise <laughs> moment, you know. I just collected what I could afford and what I would find, you know, but in many areas, in okay. many ranges. And about 15 years ago, I wrote a book about my collection. I think a copy is there. A new friend has very kindly brought one called True to the Letter that Thames and Hudson published in English. And there, I wanted to make a sort of coffee table book that could indicate to non-collectors uh, some of the extraordinary charm and attraction that these items can bring, you know. I mean, they have brought an enormous joy and pleasure to my That's life. Obvious. So I wanted to share. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and I, I, the Morgan and Colin and you have given me this opportunity of sharing it in, with this exhibition. But then, by then, I, I said that I hadn't collected many uh, philosophers, German philosophers, okay. or certain composers that are, were out of my range. But then in the following 15 years, I made some good business. I work in the art market. And um, I was able to acquire more significant items, some of which are shown here. And I took this crazy decision of trying to make an encyclopedic collection. Right. Uh, I should never. I mean, it was a fateful day, the day <laughs> when, I, when I took this. Was there was an actual a, day? No, no, it was not. No. I, I don't think it was a day. It, right. it sort of evolved. Yeah. I kept resisting. But at the end, I thought, let's try and see who are the four to 5,000 people who are most important. Four to five, let's thousand. repeat that. Huh? Four to five thousand yeah, people. Well, <laughs> yes, because it's many areas. It's right. uh, the, the areas I collect: art, literature, music, science, uh, entertainment, and history. Mm -hmm. And that covers pretty much everything. If you put sports in entertainment and fashion in art or something like that, mm -hmm. it will cover most areas. And um, so, you know, it made me study a lot books because I can't ascertain who are the greatest scientists. I don't know science well enough. You okay. know. So, I mean, but it's interesting to see how fame evolves, you know. Sure. In literary uh, fame, I can, I can judge by myself, you know, mm -hmm. and I can also see how it has evolved. And also art, if you see a book on the main artists of the 20th century written 40 years ago, it will differ markedly from a book written today. I mean, many, I mean Frida Kahlo was a footnote in Diego Rivera's 
biography. Now I think Diego Rivera is the husband of Frida Kahlo. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, which is, I mean, fair or not, uh, fame evolves, you know, right. and it's fascinating to follow its course. It is. And list know, making, list making is a list making is also exercise. one of those idle pleasures, yes. you right. know. I mean, right. And uh, you try and and find out whom you desire, you know, and you admire. Uh, of course, when I read. I was a boy about 40 years ago, the first biography of Camille Claudel. I was very touched by her story. And at that time, I was very fortunate to find a very rare uh, letter by her that is not in the exhibition. It's in the book. But, but of course, you know, I mean, basically, you have to choose uh, what you want. And this idea of an encyclopedic collection is it's ridiculous, it's like a Babel Tower. I mean, it never ends. But Let's say that I may have gotten closer than probably because no one else tried, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, to, to, to come close to obtaining representative items by these four to 5,000 people, you know. And that includes all the presidents of the United States, all the kings of France, all the kings of England, all the popes since 1500. So it's, it's, it goes, I mean, the stars and all the Nobel Prize winners, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's endless, all the British prime minister. But, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 I mean, I, I often say I should be in a straight jacket and it's right. half, uh, uh, half in jest. Because, you know, I mean, but on the other hand, it's a pursuit that hasn't harmed anyone. But my wife, probably, because I've spent <laughs> all, my, all my, all my, whatever I make, uh, I mean, uh, even before I get it, it's already spent in an auction that has happened before uh, my, my, my revenues. So, um, but, you know, I mean, then it happened. And now, I, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's fun. It's been a, a very fun pursuit. I mean, a crazy one, a ridiculously ambitious one, you know, and... Uh, but the collection is meant to be a sort of panorama of the culture I was born into, the Western culture, mm -hmm. and in the centuries where, where autographs are obtainable. Because although we do have a document of 1153, which mm -hmm. is almost 900 years in the exhibition. We'll see that in a moment. And we'll see that. I mean, the collection concentrates on the past 500 years. How I was do you maintain this list, Pedro? Well, I don't exactly maintain it. I mean, <laughs> my wife makes fun of me because I sometimes put a little dot in list, uh, I mean, the hundred greatest writers, you know, of course I can't have something by Homer or, you know, a thing sure. that, but uh, not even Shakespeare. Shakespeare, <laughs> only six signatures of his exist, you know, and I, I can't dream of that. But I do put a little dot next to the ones what, I... What number are you up to out of 5,000? I don't know. I don't keep that precise okay. a record. Right. But I would say that, of course, uh, very many important people elude me, like Galileo. Right. I mean, no oh, okay. letter of his has been offered uh, on, uh, in the market in the past 30 years, 40 years. Although Declan, uh, I mean, your predecessor yes. at, as curator of this show, got a call from a guy a few years ago saying, oh, I found this Galileo letter in a drawer, you know, he in came a drawer, from a very prominent prom yes. family. Would the Morgan Library like it? And he said, of course it would. I mean, uh, that will not happen to me, you know. And so uh, Luther, Martin Luther is also, every time I try to buy something by him, the right. price exceeded my, what I could afford. And so, but still, well, I you, mean. You did manage to acquire something by his uh, fellow uh, resident of Wittenberg. Oh, Featured yes, uh, Lucas right? Cranach, it's we have true, a Cranach who, letter, made, which is who made his rare. famous prop portrait. Actually, it's even much rarer than, than, than Luther. So? Yeah. yeah, I think this is the last remaining letter in private hand. But anyway, you know, uh, also the addressee is sometimes very important. You know, course, I mean, yeah. the letter of Franklin to Washington is something that moves me because, you know, and he's sort of flattering Washington as well. You know, and I think it's also the last one that remains in private hands. But my favorite is John Adams, which, uh, because it's a letter of Adams about his son. And he says, how my son will terminate his career, no intelligence short of divine wisdom, I believe, can foretell. Come on. He became president as well. You know? <laughs> so, um, but it's so beautifully said, you know, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's really... It's, a, it's beautifully said, and Adams was quite old at the time, and you did get old, a sense yeah. of that from his shaky handwriting. But his, his emotion comes through in that letter. Absolutely, it's, absolutely. It's a beautiful one. So 
let me ask you, when you, um, when you place the check mark next to a name, say Elizabeth I, well, right behind you know, us, I, I, do, you, do you consider that, that person fulfilled? Done. Right, done? <laughs> or are you constantly looking for upgrades? Not really, not really. I, I look for upgrades. That's okay. the problem, you know? And, uh, oh. and for certain people like uh, Napoleon, Einstein, or Picasso, right. or, or Freud, uh, or Toulouse Lautrec, who was a favorite, or Proust, I, I, I end up acquiring sometimes tens of documents. You okay. know, for, for Napoleon, it's many faces of his career, and then all his family, all his marshals, all the people around him, so that we can, if we were to draw a new, uh, okay. don't worry, Colin, it won't be at the Morgan, but a new exhibition, you know, <laughs> around Napoleon, uh, you would have enough material to make a quite, a panel that would be quite, quite uh, uh, accurate or complete of his life. But what about when you've already acquired something that's about as good as it can get for a particular person? Yeah. So behind us we have this oh, document yes, signed by Elizabeth <laughs> the First. And tell us about the circumstances. Well, that, of this. that one, that one I, I acquired at auction a long time ago. I okay. think 25, uh, 20 years ago. I've shown a detail ago. of the signature. Yeah. And uh, I had just seen a wonderful movie, you know, I mean, which was slightly romanticized, where, where um, uh, I mean, uh, Elizabeth is played by, my, my God, 60 years old now, I mean, this year. Was it Kate I Blanchett? Forgot. Kate Blanchett, exactly. Kate Blanchett plays her beautifully. Mm -hmm. And it's the weeks before her accession. And uh, of course, her sister considered her a bastard and a, 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 a heretic. So she could be either beheaded or become queen, you know, in those weeks, you know. And it, short, fortunately for her, she became queen. And uh, with the death of her sister who hated her. And of course, this is the document written two days later on her first council meeting. I mean, the first time she had the opportunity of signing an official document. So. I think she was quite relieved at that moment, and I can imagine her emotion by signing as queen this very first document. So she signed as queen, but tell us about the oh, yes. signature. Uh, I mean, uh, normally kings write either the king or they add an R, like uh, Regina, Regina or, or uh, yeah. Regina or, or Rex mm -hmm. in, 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 in Latin. And uh, I mean, interpretations vary. Some people say she didn't know yet that she had to she sign with an R. R. She was supposed yeah. to add the R, so she was still signing as a princess. And some other people consider that she thought she had to be further in her reign to start signing with that. Whichever is true, yeah. the signature is still emblematic of yeah. the fact that she was really at the very dawn of her at reign. The very dawn of her yeah. A very long reign. Yeah. Well, we were very happy that at the last minute you added this document. <laughs> a bill from Thomas Gainsborough for one of his portraits, um, because we're featuring an exhibition yes. of Gainsborough drawings right <laughs> That's now. True. It's an uh, incredible coincidence, because I, I acquired it quite recently. And it was sold by the auction house with an unrelated document, a uh, non-related drawing on the back. And it seemed odd to me that someone would take half a page that's the verso of his receipt. Yeah, this is the uh, front and the, the back. That's the bill, sheet. yeah, the, the receipt for it. And then uh, it seemed much more obvious that he would take a discarded drawing, I mean, cut the page in two, and write the receipt on the back. And eventually, two major, uh, I mean, including the curator of the exhibition, confirmed our suspicion that it was indeed a Gainsborough half drawing. Half a Gainsborough drawing. <laughs> and but, and but with the hand. Quite so wonderfully featured. It features the hand, <laughs> the hand which the magic hand of writing hand writing. is very yes. good, yes. Uh, well, I wanted to show this just to ask you a little bit about the difference between... Okay, so we meet a lot of collectors in the art world who collect works of art that are shown on walls, perhaps in their homes or in museums, whereas what you collect is very different because... Yeah, it's a are, solitary pleasure. Right. So, if I dare say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so although you do have some drawings, most of what you hold are handwritten letters and documents. Yeah that you keep locked up in fireproof cabinets, cabinets in your yes. home. Yes, it's true. They weigh half a ton each, so I have to live in a ground floor, you know, because if not, <laughs> it will make any apartment building crumble, I mean, because there are many in that room. So what's the difference then between the person who chooses to collect 
works of art that will be publicly displayed normally, and See, someone like you. Well, I mean, I can't change the nature of what I collect. Right. But it, it's true that um, it's very risky to, to frame autographs, you know, I mean, because they fade and they get lots of problems out of fading. And uh, so I, I keep them in, in, in my files. And that's why I welcome so much this incredible opportunity of sharing them for the first time, because that's the first time ever that I exhibit my collection as a collection. Well, that, we've said this many times here at the Morgan yeah. as we've been preparing for this exhibition, that even though autograph collecting is, in a way, a very solitary pursuit, you exhibit such passion for sharing it. Well, that is, a, that is yeah. extraordinary. And but I can only share it in my home with my friends, you know, I mean, so having this opportunity is fabulous. I mean, the first book was a way of sharing it as well. Right. I mean, by means of, of a printed work, but well, now it's the real thing that I, that I haven't shown. had the pleasure of visiting you at your home and, and seeing you in your element, but I've certainly heard from other visitors like Declan and um, Vic Muniz, the artist who wrote a wonderful uh, preface to the forthcoming catalog, the forthcoming catalog, that the experience of visiting you in your home is extraordinary because you seem to talking about the magic of handwriting, you seem to be a magician who can simply produce anything on call. Oh, a letter of Flaubert to mm -hmm. his master, Victor Hugo? Here it is. Uh, the opening of Remembrance of Things Past in draft form? Here it is. Um, so it's, I learned it's part it of with the, Houdini, you know, <laughs> okay. with the magician. You know, so do, you, do you derive a certain pleasure from that sort of drama of the reveal? Look, I mean, <laughs> of course, I mean, yeah, I may be a dramatic person by my <laughs> expressions, but it's not, it's, it's basically, you know, I mean, uh, of course, one is very eager to share as many as possible, and there's right. so much uh, you can impose on your friend uh, who, who come and visit you, uh, however interested they may be in what you have. But it's true that um, it's, it's quite uh, marvelous to have this room lined with this a fireproof cabinet, it's very heavy, as I told. Yeah. And you know, you have a sleepless night and you want to be uh, in the Middle Ages or in the company of Proust or in the company of the Jacobean leaders, whatever, you know, I mean, it, it, or in the company of Toulouse-Lautrec uh, around whom yeah. I've, 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 I've formed the collection. You know, you, you, it's such an extraordinary privilege to revisit the things, you know, I mean, there's the, the f f well, and then unexpected things like Napoleon Doodles, you know, alongside uh, a list of bishops in a very boring meeting, you know, where, I mean, he had to. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I have about 50 documents by now, or autographs of Napoleon, but this one was the one I selected because it's so unexpected. And also because it's all handwritten in his handwriting. His you know, appalling with, handwriting. Appalling handwriting, which is considered universally, I, like the worst at writing ever, you know. Yeah. I mean, there are still many documents that nobody can read today. You know, there are many interpretations for certain texts of his, you know, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's a moment in his life, you know, and, and why did he draw the, the, the doodles look like forts or fortifications, I don't know, you know, but. You uh, told me that you're very drawn to drawings by non draftsmen Oh, yes, that so I am. So this is an example. I am, I am drawn to some pieces that were not the traditional, uh, you know, uh, form, I mean, uh, the former collectors. Uh, I mean, I have a friend here who said to me, you have signed photographs in your exhibition, you know? He seemed to consider them as a minor form of the autograph. And I can understand him because sometimes there's just a signature, you know? And compared to a full letter, you know, uh, that doesn't mean much, apparently, I mean, to, tr to collectors of the old uh, school, you know, of which I'm also part because right. I compare my, I mean, since I can't. But I think uh, these unexpected documents right. can carry a lot of weight, <laughs> although I very much respect the opinion of my friend, you know, <laughs> who says that lengthy and uh, important letters like the, 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 the Rubens letter that was uh, addressed to Pierre Dupuis, and he mentions the invasion, the imminent invasion of Brazil by the Dutch. So finding a letter uh, of Rubens that mentions my country was an enormous uh, uh, thrill, you know. You, you, we do feature in the exhibition a number of letters by artists appearing in unexpected roles. Yeah, so that's true. this is an example, you know. 
Cronach not writing about art, but writing about being a town official in Wittenberg. Yeah. Here, Rubens writing about As a diplomat. world affairs. And I was very exactly. proud this morning to see that in the main room, there is a Rubens letter. You know, perhaps oh, yes. we can go back to the other one. Well, a Rubens you, letter is well amongst the treasures. Do you know so why that's on view? What? In because I, I, cho oh, I chose it. I did, well, uh, thank you. So publicly, <laughs> in it's our, a nod to me. <laughs> and exactly. very, in our, in our very happy to hear that. East Room, we feature treasures from the Morgan's collection. Yeah, well, wonderful. And so thinking ahead to what was going to be on view, I selected a Rubens letter to be a companion to yours. Wow. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but um, a poem by the American author Elizabeth Bishop from her time living in Brazil. In Brazil. So that is also an honor Whoa, of you. Well, thank you very so, much. I'm a great admirer of Elizabeth Bishop, and she did spend her happiest years in Brazil. In is, she, is she represented in your collection? Yes. Okay, uh, several good, letters and inscribed books, and a beautiful signed photograph, which was her favorite, okay. which is very rare in signed photographs. Well, I want to make sure to leave a little time for people to ask questions, yes, and I have many course. slides to go. So let me just um, say a little bit about some of the, the ones that remain. You've told me a lot and, and talked in your writings about these various subcategories of your collection, drawings by non-draftsmen, signed photographs. Well, as I looked at what you selected with us for the exhibition, I detected a few additional categories, and I mentioned to you that one of them is that you seem to have a particular fondness for items written when people were, as you said before, facing death. Yeah, well. Um, and so here we have... We all have right? to go <laughs> <through> <laughs> <this>. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Some of them don't have particularly extraordinary content, but they're significant because they were written just days or weeks before someone yeah. died. So we have Goethe. Well, this is Goethe, in apparently the last uh, day, uh, you said there was a Within letter. Within three days of yeah. his death. Uh, and uh, it's, it's nothing, it's just something he signs about uh, a newspaper article. And this is Lincoln three weeks before his assassination. But it's always, you know, I mean, it's better than a, a date that means so nothing, you know, I yeah, mean, exactly. when it's in relation to one's. I'm gonna this is Gandhi and uh, Wittgenstein. Please tell me. Well, I'm going to move a little bit quickly through these so we have time for questions. Of course. But um, these are in that same category. Yeah, this one moves me particularly. I got it uh, in Portugal when I was 19 for one When dollar. you were 19, you yeah. acquired this Gandhi letter. Yeah, because there was some Gandhi stuff in that bookstore, you know, an antiquarian bookstore. It was mostly things by his sons and things like that. And he told me, there's nothing by Gandhi. Don't even, but I, I knew this was by Gandhi. So, uh, so he sold me a, a, a dollar piece, you know. And this is a letter 10 months before his assassination uh, of a guy who was a friend of, I mean, his brother was a friend of Gandhi uh, much before in South Africa. And he writes to him and says, oh, you were a friend of my brother. And he says, uh, I must not divide my attention for things great or small. It will be time for me to consider others if I come up safe from the far which I'm trying to quench. The odds are so great that the fire may quench me instead of my quenching me. So for a prophetic letter, it's, it's a good one. You know, I, I quite like it. And um, well, this is, uh, yeah, this is the first letter uh, that uh, Toulouse-Lautrec ever signed. He was eight. His mother wrote the text, but he did this beautiful flourish in the signature. And this is the last known uh, written message by him. So, I had the privilege of having the first, the opening and the last letter of this correspondence. And the next image brings us to the sort of document I quite like, which is this Freud card, for instance. Those that have an immediate res resonance, you say? Reson resonance, yes. Resonance and an immediate understanding, you know. For uh, uh, an American patient, Freud writes, 20 hours, 2,000 florins. So, in a certain way, it's a resume of psychoanalysis. You know? <laughs> uh, and a bill, in a the, bill for therapy in Freud's with Dr. own Freud. handwriting. Yes. Yeah, and there's a Goya. This is a document that I also acquired in my 20s. You know, this uh, old gentleman that had beautiful uh, autographs to sell. I mean, he was a great specialist. He had already retired, and he had wonderful Monet letters in his hands, and I couldn't afford any of them. You know, and this one, I asked, and what about this thing? Oh, this is just a notarial document. You can have it for, I don't know, I mean, the money I had for three weeks, but still, uh -huh. I spent it. Uh, and he says, I, I the undersigned Claude Monet. It's, it, it's a very 
uh, emotional document for me because it shows the very diff difficult beginnings of the Impressionists who became so rich, the ones who survived later on. I didn't sign Claude Monet, recognized having received from Gustave Manet, the brother of Manet, the painter, the sum of a thousand francs. It would be, what, $2,000 today or something. And as a collateral, he leaves 35 of his paintings, you know. I mean, and uh, he leaves eight, and then the other 27 that he's still retouching, including one uh, representing uh, a Japanese woman uh, life-size, which is the pride today of the Fine Arts <coughs> Museum of Boston, uh, will be remitted as they are completed. So I think, you know, a very simple document, but which means a lot. I think so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and you can say that I was gathering here documents related to money. To money, yes, yes it's true. <laughs> um, but I, didn't, I don't want this group to leave without seeing one of the Real, real prize of your collection. So well, tell us about this. This is the one we hung upside down by mistake. <laughs> and I just, just in our defense, I would like to say, you can see how you can Proust, see. It makes sense. Right, the top three lines he wrote it while the paper decided, was flipped the yeah. other way. So it's understandable that we, we got that wrong. Well, Proust is a particular favorite of mine. I mean, I've assembled a large collection with about 30 letters, manuscripts, and many hundreds of letters and photographs of the people who inspired his characters. So, and people writing about him, etc. So, um, when I saw this in a German auction, you know, I was completely, I mean, it was unknown. I mean, it hadn't been studied yet. And uh, had it appeared at auction in France, it would have been immediately grabbed by the National Library of France for their, because there they can substitute themselves to the last person in an auction. Yes. So, they let the auction happen, and then you're happy. You finally got your thing. And then I said, no, sorry. I mean, the French state wants this for the museum so-and-so. You know, and they have the right to substitute to the last bid. And here, it was in Germany, so we were not under this risk. And these are the first, very first sentences of arguably the most important novel of the 20th century, and perhaps one of the most immortal, immortal wor works of, of world literature. Unless you want to argue for Ulysses. What? Unless you want to argue for Ulysses. Yes, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, English speaking readers will argue for Ulysses, and I can understand that. But then, for, in the case of Proust, you know, I mean, I, I, I had to have it. But of course, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have the money if it went too high. But at that time, I was president of the National Library of Brazil, with a brief stint with public service that lasted only three, it was about 15 years ago, three, uh, three, three years. And I was in the airport. I had to go to Brasilia. You were bidding? On yeah, I was bidding the on the phone. Okay. The German lady spoke very bad English. I couldn't understand what she said. And at the end, she said, you, you have it. And I was ecstatic. And I asked the price. It was double what I wanted to pay. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't understand. But at the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm so happy that I it's didn't here. understand what she off. was saying yeah. today, you know? So that's it. And <laughs> those who read French and know the novel well, will notice what's missing here from this yeah, first paragraph. Yeah, the famous first sentence, longtemps je me suis couché de bonheur. Uh, longtemps je me suis couché de bonheur means... Uh, for a long, long time, time I used to go to bed early. I used to go to bed early. Here. So here is, uh, during many years, I mean, the idea of many years is already there, but the whole idea of, of, the, of the candle being spent and he mixing uh, what he what he's dreaming about, what he was reading, and everything is already there. Well, I'd like to, um, I remember when you were speaking recently to a journalist, and she asked, well, who is the audience for this exhibition? Who is this exhibition for? And you said, well, anyone with an open spirit. <laughs> and I thought that was a beautiful answer and something that you've really conveyed today in your conversation with me and with all of us. So thank you very much for your open spirit in sharing all of this and sharing your stories. Um, please join me in thanking Pedro. <laughs> thank you. So we've been going thank you, for about Christine, for the way you. you've handled uh, not only this conversation, <laughs> but this exhibition, this catalog. And uh, I mean, and we've shared. Yes, the passion we have. We for these things, have. We have. and it has been a great privilege for me. Thank you very much.
Sure, sure. If we can have the house lights up, and then we are, we're videotaping this, so I'll acknowledge you, and then I'll repeat the question. So if you have any questions, yes, right here. All right, I'll just, I'll try to summarize this. Uh, the, the first part is, are you being pursued by dealers? Uh, and then how do you vet well, the authenticity of some of the coach. materials? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but of course, I mean, there is a sort of core collection that I, I wouldn't ever touch, you know. But I try to improve my items, you know. And so sometimes an item that was satisfactory when I was 30 or 40, is not satisfactory anymore when I'm 60 and I've been offered better items. So sometimes I trade. I mean, that Van Gogh letter, I traded partly for items that the dealer was interested in. So I, I'm not very good at selling. I mean, uh, I'm a very bad seller because I love all these items. And, uh, but sometimes I do this. I don't know whom I compete against, you know. I mean, sometimes I feel I'm in uh, one of those, um, how do you say, those dogs that, uh, that run? I mean, uh, greyhounds. In those greyhound races, you know, where you have a mechanical greyhound that guides the others. I, I'm constantly competing against a mechanical greyhound that I don't know the, whom it is, you know, and I only learned that I was competing against famous collectors when they die and I see the catalog of their sales. You know, I mean, and uh, so, I mean, being in Brazil, you are isolated. You're neither in Europe nor in North, North America where the, the main markets are. So, in a way, it's an advantage, but also you, you don't participate in clubs like here in New York, the Grohler Club, where you meet other collectors and you can exchange views. I mean, where you can see that people are much saner than you are and collect just one particular author or a period or something. So that, that I, I didn't have this, this chance, you know. I was always very curious about uh, who were the people who were sharing my passion uh, and were unknown to me. Thank uh -huh. you. Yes, uh, yes, up there. Look, very often, very often, because uh, a collector, after so many decades, you know, I read, uh, you, you wrote a text saying that for almost half a century, uh, I've collected. I mean, I was shocked because I started Sorry at 11. About that. No, that was great. But <laughs> during this half century, let's put it this way, um, you, you have serendipity exists. I mean, uh, is everywhere. So sometimes you're very lucky. And amongst things that have not been recognized as important things, you find a gem or a jewel or something like that. I mean, I found my Michelangelo uh, amongst a lot that I bought from a famous auction house, and it had not been identified as a Michelangelo drawing. You know, so that's luck, I mean, I will say. But I, I, I couldn't go before the sale and examine the lot. I would have recognized the Michelangelo. But um, I knew. Uh, that this lot was very promising, and so I bid heavily for it. But I can tell you, when I took the train back, you know, from London to Paris, where I had I picked up this lot, and suddenly a piece of paper falls on the floor of the train. It's and, this big. And uh, yeah, this big. And I see a Michelangelo drawing, and there was another one in the sale. I think, well, I, I won't say the word that came to my mind, but <laughs> oh, oh, well. Uh, they gave me the wrong one. I mean, they should have given it to the buyer, not for me. No, I, there was another Michelangelo drawing in that, in that collection, and uh, I was a lucky buyer. And it was so on the floor of the train for a It moment? was on the floor of the train for a few seconds. <laughs> but uh, then I, 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 I grabbed it. And, uh, and of course, I mean, uh, sometimes we deserve this sort of luck because we also overpay for certain items. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I often do. I have and, one of them. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, it's, 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 it's fantastic to be able to go through all this. 
this was who experience was something, you know, I mean. But, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it, it, it's what I said. It's all about pleasure. I mean, uh, collecting and being passionate about something enhances your life in so many ways. Uh, it's, it's, it's brought me, I think I, I was much happier thanks to this. Of course, I was anguished very often <laughs> before a sale or frustrated that I couldn't get something. But then you move on to something else, and I was never bored. I was always dreaming of what I was to acquire next, you know. And so uh, I, that's about it. <laughs> that's oh, okay. We have one more because uh, that that was really an eloquent way to end. But I will. No, but please. except we will. Uh, I, I, if you're yes. ready, I can stay no, no, as no, long yes. as you wish. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat this. Um, the question was, um, does your collecting has of handwriting, uh, has that uh, impacted the way that you communicate? You know, in the 18th century, you know, even if you were of a much higher uh, social sta status than the person you were writing to, you would always end, you're a very humble servant, so-and-so, you know. And I, I don't end my letters with your humble servant anymore. But it has influenced, yes, uh, to a certain degree. I think reading so many letters may have influenced my, my own writing. I mean, I write books on Brazilian art in other languages and everything. But, uh, you know, it has enriched my life in so many ways, that probably in this way as well, you know. And it's, it's something that I never planned. I, I started collecting at 11. I mean, I had a brother who collected coins, you know. And I wanted to collect something. And I had heard that people collected either stamps or coins or autographs. I didn't even know very well what that meant. You know, my brother collected coins. My mother hated stamps for some strange reason and forbid me to, which was the greatest favor she did me. The greatest favor she did me. She had an uncle who had died young and who supposedly had a fantastic stamp collection that the widow sold a week later for a trifle amount. You know, and my mother always had this trauma of the uncle's collection. She said, no, you shouldn't collect stamps. Okay, I mean, what can I say at 11? But she did me a fantastic favor. And then I started with a, a notebook asking for signatures, very less of people at that time. And then I went to Belgium. My father was a diplomat. He was transferred there. And I started writing to people. And that's how the whole thing... But I didn't know a market existed. I didn't know that there were dealers and autographs. I mean, all this I discovered much later. And, but most, I mean, my beginnings are not very representative of what the collection is now because I would say that 95% of my time spending, spent in collection was acquiring items and not uh, getting them in person. Very few were gotten in person. I, I don't see myself as an autograph hunter, I must say. Uh, but I enjoyed the things I would get through the mail a lot. I mean, I, I got hundreds of answers and I would come back from school to try and see if uh, Agatha Christie or Rubinstein or Miro or Golda Meir had answered my letter, and they did, you know. And so it was a thrill for a boy, you know. And there are so many things that can get lost during your teens, you know, if you don't have a sort of direction. And it gave me a direction for my readings, and I read much more. I, I wanted to know whom I had to write to. You know, so I had to know who were the greatest living painters. You know, already the list. You know, and so I would, I would see, and I would write in priority to the elders, of course. You know, my brothers uh, kept making fun of me. I have, I had four, four brothers, and they would say that my letter was like the kiss of death. You know, because I would write mostly to the people, but many survived. But some, uh, uh, and uh, so you know, I mean. Uh, it was great fun for me, it was fun for them. You know, many didn't answer, I mean, Picasso didn't answer. But my letter is in his archive because he wouldn't throw away anything. You know what I mean? And so, uh, so you know, I mean, all this uh, developed in a sort of unfathomable way, you know, and, and, and it led me to the morning. So it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's a miracle. I, I would just like to add um, to the person, I believe the person who just asked that question, if I'm not mistaken, has yeah. just founded a new magazine about love letters. Is that correct? Oh, really? Yes, so oh, welcome to the wonderful. world of correspondence. Um, yeah. But as the recipient of correspondence from Pedro, I can tell you that yes, he has been affected um, <laughs> by the, the uh, items in his collection because it's Very just, pompous. Just in the last few weeks, I received a WhatsApp text from him that included the words, your humble servant. <laughs> um, but so. that was in jest. That was in jest. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, right. uh, but it's, there's a very successful site, I think, of letters of notes or something like that that has yeah. millions of people. And this guy had this very clever idea of searching for incredible letters, but not, they don't belong to him. I mean, I have this privilege of having yeah. them in, in, in my own house. And I think this gentleman found a fantastic letter of Fidel Castro to Franklin Roosevelt, asking him for a $10 note. At that point, he was 13, you know, and he wrote to Roosevelt. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, so, of course, he has a much wider range because he, then he can write about all the letters that have been written ever. And your love letters interest me a lot. I have a few in the collection, if you want them, and they are at your disposal. <laughs> <laughs> because I love to share. I mean, I, I, I often, uh, I mean, I've lent items to certain exhibitions, of course, for, but people don't know I have this. Perhaps now they will come more often. And I don't worry, I don't worry if they are published or unpublished. I mean, I know it's very important for universities, but uh, even if I have an unpublished one, I'm very happy that it becomes published. Uh, by an exhibition or something. So feel free if you want them. And all my love letters are yours. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your collection and your stories with us. Uh, the Magic of Handwriting will be open until 8.30 this evening. If you want to take another look or you haven't seen it yet and tell all your friends, this exhibition will be open through September. Um, and thank you so much for coming and give Pedro and Christine a round of applause. Thank you.